for its rustic architecture, but I like park architecture a little bit better. Merrill Ann Wilson said of architecture that perhaps for the first time in the history of American architecture, a building has become an accessory of nature. <clears throat> and it really has. This is the, this is the, the journey of park architecture. Okay, these are the, the first 15 or so uh, parks, starting with Yellowstone Park at the top, 1872. And I say or so because Grand Canyon was admitted as a National Forest Reserve and it was admitted as a park down here later. Uh, in 1886, the Army came in and saved the parks. Yellowstone was being poached and destroyed pretty much. So the, the Army came in in 1886 and they stayed for 30 years until 1916. The first four that are, have an asterisk behind them were occupied by the Army and administered by the Army. This is Cinnabar. The, uh, the Yellowstone Park was pretty much uh, developed by the railroads. They saw a, a real opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, for tourism. So as soon as they got to the Livingston area, they, they laid tracks down toward Gardner. This is, this is the town or the village of Cinnabar. It's, and you may know approximately where it is because right about here is the uh, Gardner Airport. So if you're leaving Gardner, heading north, you look across the river, you might see Cinnabar. This is Cinnabar Mountain. That's where the Devil Slide is. The Devil Slide is made up of mercury sulfide, which makes it red. I always kind of thought it was uh, iron ore or something like that. There is the Yellowstone River, comes around here and goes through Yankee Jim Canyon. And here is the road, the, the stage road, that goes up to Mammoth. <clears throat> At the time, what was happening in Yellowstone was pretty much a free-for-all. People could build buildings wherever they wanted them. Uh, they, they didn't have to adhere to any sort of uh, aesthetic. This hotel, this, this was actually a number of things. It was a hotel, it was uh, an administration building. It replaced a hotel that was called, it was dubbed the Shingle Hotel because it was so poorly built. And it burned down and a year later they built this hotel here. This is Mail Carrier's Cabin, built in 1895. If you're at the north end of the, the double street coming into um, Mammoth, you see the mail carrier's cabin. It's still is standing there. Mail carrier used to pick up mail at the train station at Cinnabar and take it all the way to Cook City. So that's one of the few buildings, old buildings, very old building that's still there. By 1903, there was a land dispute from the end of the train tracks at Cinnabar three miles until they got to, to uh, Gardner. So by 1903, Gardner had finally gotten the train. <clears throat> and there are three significant buildings here. Oops. Uh-oh. Let's see, try that. There we go. Um, there are three significant buildings here. The W.A. Hall store, the Roosevelt Arch, and the train station. These are all built in 1903. This, this building, the W.A. Hall still exists, and of course that art still exists. The train station has been torn down. These two buildings were designed by Robert Reamer, and we'll talk about him a little bit later. And I have yet to find the exact provenance of the Roosevelt Arch. It was conceived by Hiram Chittenden, who was with the Army Corps of Engineers, but it was either built by Robert Reamer or it was built by another architect, architect named Nils, Nils Ness. No, no relation to Elliot, I don't believe. <laughs> so what was happening in the other parks? There was still development taking the other parks, taking place in the other parks. This is the Conti Memorial Lodge. This was the, the visitor center for Yosemite. And you can see they're already starting an architecture or, or a architecture type look. 
This is granite, and it's God, I keep blowing it here. This is this is granite, so it's made is built from local local materials, and it has a very alpine look. I think this this little moon door there is actually kind of curious to me. And and, and the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon is being served by the Santa Fe Railroad. <laughs> And the Grand Canyon, this was a Hopi house built in 1905. Keep in mind that the park service didn't exist yet. And this was, was not a park yet. But the Hopi house was built like a, a Pueblo. And it was, it was a, a um, gift shop, Indian gift shop. And I looked around to find it. And I found that in, on Haleakala, they built a... A, a guest house, if you're going to call that. And once again, it's made from local stone. So there, there were things taking place with local stone all around in different parks at the, at the same time. At this time, there were, we were just leaving the Victorian era and the uh, Queen Anne home. I don't know why the Victorian era has to have Queen Anne homes. This is, it seems like it should be Queen Anne or Victorian homes. And we're transitioning into the bungalow era or the craftsman era. So this was taking place right between those two. So where does park architecture really originate? Generally, it originated in the chalets in, in the alpine areas of Switzerland and Norway. And if so, how did they get to this country? Well, there were the great camps taking place in the Adirondack Mountains. And uh, the, this is the Great Camp Sagamore, and the Vanderbilts wanted to leave, get out of Millionaire's Row in New York City and have their own camp. And so they employed William West Durant to design a, uh, a structure for them, which just looks like an enlarged version of what we saw in the previous slide. Things were taking place on the West Coast too. So William West Durant was working on the East Coast and he was credited with starting the idea of, of park architecture. And uh, it was said that he, that any log cabin in, uh, in the Colorado Rockies could be attributed to his, or lodge could be attributed to his, his work. On the West Coast, Bernard Maybach was a professor of architecture at UC Berkeley. And he built with natural stones, he called it, he used natural materials used honestly. <laughs> this, and by the way, is still there. This is a contemporary photograph. This is in the southwest corner of Lake Tahoe. If you're familiar with that at all, there's a lake, a small lake there called Fallen Leaf Lake, and this is around the edge of Desolation Wilderness. Beautiful little, little structure there. And major contributors to the park architecture were the, the, the Green brothers, Henry and Charles Green. They were born in Ohio, and uh, they went to school in the East Coast. One of them went to school at MIT. Their parents since moved to Pasadena, so they moved to Pasadena. <coughs> and at the time, there's a real interest in Japanese architecture and all things Japanese. And they, at one point, uh, attended the Louisiana Purchase 100 year exposition in 1904, and they saw this Japanese house, and they were really taken by it with, with the openness. It was so much different than the Victorian homes that, that were of the day. So they started developing what would become the ultimate bungalow. And this is one of their pieces along the way. And you can see it's starting to evolve with the Japanese look, but toward uh, uh, the bungalow look and the natural stones, like the little, the, oops, like the little teeny stones parked in right here. And if you've been to Pasadena, you may know about the Gamble House. This is the Gambles from Proctor and Gamble. And this house is now open to the public. It's owned by USC and the in Pasadena, the city of Pasadena. You can do tours of this house. I'm jumping forward a little bit, but just to conclude where Green and Green were going. They were 
they were mostly in, in Southern California. So enter Herrenchild and Robert Riemann. A Herrenchild was born in San Francisco in 1857. He made his fortune in the uh, uh, San Francisco Stock Exchange. He moved to Montana in the 1880s. He got involved in mining and ranching. In fact, he and Charles Anson started the Flying D Ranch out of uh, Gallup Gateway and he, he pretty much financed the thing. So rich people of the day, or wealthy people of the day, oftentimes would not winter in, in Montana. They would go to Southern California and that was about the only place they could go because Las Vegas really didn't exist and Phoenix really didn't exist. So they'd go down to Southern California. <clears throat> Robert Reamer comes into the picture because he was also born in Ohio and he worked his way to Southern California and he worked at the Del Coronado Hotel. He did not build the, the original hotel, but he became a head designer of the Del, Del Coronado. And so he did some remodeling, he did some extra additions, and uh, Harry Child was living at the Del Coronado Hotel at the same time, and he was impressed with Robert Raymer, and he, and he in, the, in the meantime, Harry Child had bought in to the National Park, the YP Company, Yellow National Park, Yellowstone Park Company. Um, and so he owned half of the stock in the YP Company at that time. And he would, there was a, a talk that they wanted to build a, a, a significant building in Old Faithful. And it would be going to be, it was, it was to be called the Old Faithful Tavern initially. Well, he approached Harry Child, or he, Harry Child approached Robert Reamer here in, Del, in uh, the Del Coronado Hotel. And Robert Reamer did not give his two weeks notice. He didn't give a two minute notice. He just disappeared. And he got on a train and he headed up to, to Yellowstone Park. So in 1903, if you remember that slide of Gardner, in 1903 he did the train station at Gardner, he did the W.A. Hall store in Gardner, and he was building and designing the Old Faithful Inn. And they worked this, this, the summer and into the fall and early winter uh, to enclose the building. And during that time, he was also remodeling the Lake Hotel. And there were as many as 90 craftsmen working on those two buildings throughout the winter of 1904. And by August of 1904, the Lake Hotel was finished. And they added, of course, these columns here in the front and spruced the whole thing up, of course. And that same year, the Old Faithful, it became the Old Faithful Inn by that time, opened in uh, at, at the Upper Geyser Basin. Note these, these fly rafters or these barge rafters that extend up beyond the peaks of the roof. And that, that gave it a real rustic look. And we'll, we'll find out a little bit more about that later. And so one of the uh, reporters of the day said it, it appeared that the that the designer of this building was coming out of a, a monumental immersion in malt as he, <laughs> as he designed this. And he said, because he could tell because of all the contours inside the building. <laughs> but it was actually, it was also called, called, called by another uh, uh, reporter, uh, uh, what was it, a, uh, I'll skip that one. I can't remember the <laughs> right. So about 1907, Harry Child bought out the YP Company. So, let, so the Northern Pacific Railway divested from all the transportation and concessionaires in the park, and they carried the papers. So this, this is a, this garage designed also by Robert Reamer, and so you can see the the park architecture is really developing by this time. <clears throat> In 1915, there was a major change. They brought automobiles to the park. And this particular photograph I got at the 
um, Yellowstone Gateway Museum in Livingston. And I just love it because he's got he's got six pennants along here. Jamestown, North Dakota, Billings, Livingston, Hunters Hot Springs, and I can't read that one, and I can't read that one. But it looks like a cross-country tour. They probably have a pretty good time of it. <laughs> They're all chained up here. <clears throat> so at that time, when cars could come into the park, they had a real problem between the horses and the cars. Of course, that was happening everywhere. So the cars would have to stop, turn off their motor, let the car, let the horse go by. But it wasn't very long before they just said, okay, no more horses in, in, on the roads in the park. But at the time, you could park anywhere. This is Sylvan Lake. It's just like if you went out to the Forest Service right now, you just pull off the road, and you could camp anywhere. The other option for people besides staying in the luxury hotels would be to stay at the Wiley Camps or another camping, tent camping area. These reached way back into the horse and buggy and stage day, and they, 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 they've come forward. But if that isn't glamping, I don't think there is. <laughs> <Jesus. laughs> wow. There are other companies that had camping uh, tent camps, but Wiley Company, and he was based here in Bozeman, um, was the, the main one. This is Fort Yellowstone. There's, keep in mind, we're still being administrated by the, by the Army, and Fort Yellowstone is developing. Right here, of course, is the present-day um, visitor center. This road here is one of the roads that came up from, the, from Gardner. By the way, that road, that road that they're using right now, in fact, the old stage road left Gardner, and it came kind of the back way into here. And since the, since the flood that took place last spring, they've rebuilt, they, they paved the old stage road. So when you go into the park now, you will be driving on the original old stage road. And it came in right here. The, the four lane split road is right here. And the mail carrier's cabin is off there. So you will no longer come up that that steep part and come into Mammoth that way. And I haven't been there yet, but that's what I understand is taking place. <clears throat> so in 1916, the Park Service came into being, but it wasn't until 1918 that the Army finally left the park. And this is one of the last parades. This is the old National Hotel, which has been torn down. The, the new Mammoth Hotel sits back here now. But the important thing about this photograph, the unique thing about this photograph, is this guy right here. That's Jonathan L. Jonathan M. Wainwright. He was the officer of the day. And if you know anything about your World War II history, uh, Wainwright was with MacArthur, and they were driven down to the Bataan Peninsula. MacArthur was ordered by FDR to, to leave the Philippines and Jonathan Wainwright surrendered to the Japanese and spent his whole entire war in a prisoner of war camp. As soon as the, the Park Service finally took over, which is 1918, the, the first administrator was Charles Puncher. He was a, a landscape engineer, and he only lasted until 1920, but he started moving toward um, park architecture. So he would decide on where buildings were going to be and what they would look like. They, they came through his office. Keep in mind, we're not talking just entirely Yellowstone, we're talking all the parks. So we're talking um, the parks in, uh, for instance, Grand Canyon, the park architecture would still draw from the environment that it came from. Puncher unfortunately died of tuberculosis in 1920. And he was replaced by his subordinate, Daniel Hall, who was there for seven years. So Daniel Hall was, took the idea and just solidified it in a park architecture. He wanted to, to be using natural materials from the area, and he would decide on what they looked like. <clears throat> so he was the person who really brought park architecture to the fore. 
And this is one of his buildings. It's not that great, but it's it's at the it's the Lake Ranger Station. It's still there to this day. It looks just like that right now to this day. So enter Fred Wilson. This picture is taken in 1924. I know that because he's got three three of his kids there, and this one is born in 1924. So that kind of puts that together. That's his wife Helen and his three three children there. So Fred Wilson was born in 1877 in Bozeman, and uh, in Bozeman, Montana Territory, I should say. One month after. Chief Joseph surrendered the Bearspaw Mountains up near Haver, and 16 months after the Little Bighorn. Main Street didn't get paved till 1910. He was six years old when the train, when the Northern Pacific train came through. He was 12 years old when Montana became a state. He was educated in the schools here in, in Bozeman. He started briefly, he was at Montana State, which at the time was called Montana Agricultural College, but there was no architecture department. So he, he left and got a degree in architecture from Columbia University. After that, he had a brief stint in Helena, and then he took off to Europe. Well, the, the myth is that he studied at Beaux-Arts for two years. Well, first of all, he wasn't there for two years, and second of all, he didn't study steadily at Beaux Arts for two years. His he had access to his his father's American Express account, so he traveled <laughs> all around Europe. And you can see here he's he's playing the flute baguette. <laughs> so he was having quite a nap of time there, but he was absorbing the architecture and the culture of Europe. And he used that, he drew from that the rest of his life. So he, he was being self-taught. Once in a while, he'd go in and take a, a class at, at uh, Beaux-Arts in Paris. And he was a Montana kid, and he, he wasn't a bohemian, as you can see. He was certainly not a bohemian. So he didn't fit in. And at one point, his, his father, who was Lester Wilson, who started the Wilson Company and was quite wealthy here in town, came over to see what's going on, and I think he pretty well said, you know, it's time for you to come home. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing they did, he and his dad attended a parade of Beaux-Arts students in downtown Paris. They had concluded a trip traveling throughout the, Europe, he and his mother and his, his father. And Fred said in his diaries, he didn't like all the naked bodies in the, in the parade, so I think that just kind of put him over the top. So he, he came back to Bozeman in 1910, and he designed Hamilton Hall, that was the first building. And Bozeman was just dying for a full-time architect at the time, so he had lots of work. And at the same time, by, by about 1919, about 1918, 19, Fred designed this Lake Lodge. Well, what has happened is the, the uh, uh, tent camps were being evaluated by the Park Service. And they thought, well, these tent camps didn't have a focus, didn't have a central lodge. So they came up with this lodge system. And this is Lake Lodge and it still sits there. There, you can see right there, there's a little tent camp right there, or a little tent building. So this would be the meeting place you could have a restaurant there, you could have programs there, so you didn't have to sit in your tent <clears throat> all the time. <clears throat> I threw this one in because it was just a, a nice respite from Fred Wilson and everything else. <laughs> that right there is a 1928 Harley. <laughs> These are 1928 bears. <laughs> 1928 people. <laughs> but these are the and they look like they're standing in front of just a, a real basic building. So they certainly weren't at, at the Lake Hotel, or they weren't at the Old Faithful Inn. This is looking the other direction at Lake Lodge. And you can see more of those little tents back here. So you would rent a tent, and then you could come in and have uh, um, you could eat breakfast there, you could have meals there, there would be programs there. So that would be the center of that. And it's still that way today. 
The difference is these have been replaced with little log cabins. And here's a tent camp. This, this, is, this is a single room tent cabin. It's wood up to here and canvas above there. This is a two room by virtue of the fact that you pull that curtain between the two. <laughs> they get sued for false advertising in these days. But it's identical on both sides. So Fred designed these two. He designed the Mammoth Lodge, which was, which was torn down in 1949. And he designed the Canyon Lodge, which was uh, surplus in 1955 and it burned down in 1957. So these, these lodges are no longer there. He also did the Old Faithful Lodge, which still is there. This part of the Old Faithful Lodge is not his. This is one of those buildings where someone started it, someone else added to it, and someone else added to it. So it's changed. This part right here, near as I can tell, is Fred Wilson. And I found a blueprint that kind of corroborated that for me. <clears throat> this is the inside of it. So it's a nice, it was a bad day, rainy day. You can enjoy Old Faithful from there. In addition to that, he designed the Old Faithful Recreation Building right here. This is the Old Faithful Lodge. Yellow, uh, Old Faithful is over the, behind this, this building here. And this is for the enjoyment of the park employees. This is the interior of it. I think it's a pretty impressive little interior for the employees. They don't get paid much anyway, so they must have been basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and he designed guest cabins, one and two bedroom guest cabins. He designed comfort stations. So he designed all kinds of stuff. And the park service would just place, they would, they would decide they're going to have three one-bedroom cabins here and, and two two-bedroom cabins here. So he designed one design and it got used throughout the park. Fred really liked getting away from Bozeman, going down to the park. He usually would drive, he would oftentimes drive, in the early days, he'd drive to Livingston and take the train down. Other times he would drive down all the way. But in those days, it wasn't until about mid-30s that, that you could have a radio in your car. And if you had reception, that'd be amazing. And Motorola radios were the car radio at the time. And so he'd get away from the telegraph, he'd get away from the, 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 uh, all the politics, he'd get away from the clients, he'd get away from everything and just drive down to Yellowstone Park and enjoy his his day down there. One particular time he wrote in his diaries, he wrote daily diaries, by the way. He, one particular time, he stopped <coughs> along the, alongside the road, and it must have been in the late fall, because there was a, a young woman figure skating on a beaver pond. And he stopped and says, she was a real artist. He would write single lines like that. <clears throat> Other times he would just enjoy the foliage. And he would almost always have a weekly flat tire. <laughs> in fact, one, kind, one time, not, not related to Yellowstone Park, he was working on the Anthony Ranch. Um, and if you go from Four Corners to Norris, toward Norris, you run past a, a, an elevator. Well, he designed a, a, a town there called Anthony. And he went out there to check on, on laying out this town, it was never built. And coming back, he had seven flat tires. <laughs> and it could have been different tires, he didn't say. But in those days, you had a split rim, you had four bolts, you unbolt that, you jack up your car, you take off half the rim, you pull off the tire, you replay, you, you, you test it and patch it just like a new bicycle tire. You put it back on, bolt the thing back together, and take off again, and you have another flat tire. So. Road conditions weren't good in those days at all. <clears throat> the one thing that's kind of unfortunate he, is Fred didn't get the real plum jobs in Yellowstone. This is the Madison Junction Museum. It's a beautiful structure. <clears throat> and it was done by a, a, an architect in San Francisco. The park, National Park Service was based in San Francisco originally, then it moved to Los Angeles. And so, the closer you are to the purse strings, 
the more good things are going to happen in your in your life. So Fred was given just the administrative work up here. He didn't have a chance to do the real nice jobs, but he liked that. And so whenever he had a chance, he would jump on that. This is the Eagle Store. Built three parts. This first one, second part, and third part. He built this. He was so enthusiastic about building this for Sam Eagle that he didn't even charge him. <laughs> Fred always had a hard time with, with finances anyway. I mean, this didn't help that out at all. <laughs> but this is Highway 191 to Bozeman's right here. You come up and you turn left and go into Yellowstone Park. It still sits there. It's hidden a little bit by a, a modern canopy that goes across here. And the Eagle Store has just sold this summer. So who knows what's going to happen to it. <clears throat> this is the last part they added on the Eagle Store. And inside is a soda fountain. <laughs> and this is the original, the original tile on the soda fountain. And it's still there. And there's your 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 grind, your, your mixer. And it, it's a, a step back in time. And it is worth stopping there and having a soda and or a, a malt. Um, and th this person right here is with us tonight. <laughs> Directly across the street, directly across the street to the west, was the Stewart's gas station. And the reason I mentioned those, those barge rafters is they've been repeated right here. This is, to me, this is just an incredible little, st little station. Unfortunately, it burned in 1955, and there's no gas station there at all right now. <laughs> but wherever he had a chance, he would introduce park architecture. And he was, a, he was an eclectic architect because you had to be an eclectic architect in those days to stay alive in a small town. So if someone wanted uh, this style of building or that style of building, he designed it for them. He really honestly believed that architecture was a form of public service. Um, To, to give you a contrast of what else he was doing at the same time, when he did the Lake Lodge, he did the Commercial National Bank. And if you've been downtown right now, it's all scaffolded up because it had a facade put on it in the 70s, and it's being liberated from that facade. So this is exactly what it looked like then, and that's what they're going back to now. And to me, that's one of the really exciting things that's taking place in downtown today. It's almost bookended, on the other end, by the Baxter Hotel. And this was done in 1928, about the same time he was doing, uh, he did the Eagle Store. So he'd do a log cabin one day, and he would do something like this, or he did the Ellen Theater in 1919, when he did this. So he, the, the range that he used was, was truly amazing. About three, two miles, two or three miles inside of the mouth of, Grand, of the Gallant Canyon, you will find Rock Haven Chapel. And there are some climbing ropes there. So once again, Fred has escaped the, the park and he's, he is still using park architecture. This is a really cute little building because behind the altar is, it, is a fireplace. Cute little place. I've never been there for any sort of service, but I've been there the door seemed to be open when I arrived. Maybe it's just because of me. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting going inside there. Right at Spanish Creek, the, he designed this, this arch out of redwood logs. The Gallon Gateway to the Yellowstone National Park. The Milwaukee Railroad, as you can see by these logos here and there, Milwaukee Railroad arrived in what is what was called Salesville. And they improved the road to Yellowstone, right through here. And they put this inside the mouth of the canyon at Spanish Creek. And they used their influence to change the name of Salesville to Gallatin Gateway. <laughs> this was torn down during the war because the trucks 
couldn't get through there. The big trucks couldn't get through there. So that's this one is long gone. And uh, one of the last things he did here in town in uh, park architecture style was the Bogert Grove, Bogert's Grove Bandstand. And I just want to correct, it's Bogert, it's not Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> it was Bogert's Grove. Uh, John Vesu, John Vreeland Bogart, Bogart, <laughs> the, uh, the, the first mayor of Bozeman, and apparently he owned this grove of trees. And I, one, one little aside is that he would write anonymous letters to the editor, and he'd always assign, assign his name Vesuvius. But since his name was Vreeland, his middle name was Vreeland, he became John Vesuvius Boger. <laughs> I don't know, I, I thought maybe it had something to do with his, with his personality. Okay, during the, during the war, of course, everything was, was funneled toward uh, the war effort. So the park just fell apart. It was almost bankrupt by the end of the war. And a number of things took place at that time. Uh, tourists were just pouring into the park. People had cars. They were, they were experiencing uh, newfound freedom. And the Park Service had to come up with something that would, that would solve this, these problems and quickly. And link that with all the new technologies that, that were found and discovered during World War II. And, they, and uh, I guess they were ready to leave 40, 40 years of park architecture behind. So they started building these buildings where they could be um, pre-assembled off-site or pre-building, the parts could be built off-site. They could be assembled really quickly. And they could be assembled without a whole bunch of craftsmen putting them together. And with these blue lamb beams or laminated wood beams, you can make a lot larger space for a lot more people. So this particular building, Canyon Lake Lodge, was designed in 1956. At that time, the Park Service came up with this new uh, concept called Mission 66. And they wanted to uh, update everything in the park. And the, uh, the then the director of the Park Service said, "All disregard all precedences. We, we have to come up with something new. We will explore anything. And so they decided to start moving the uh, human uh, structures away from the from the uh, natural attractions and one thing they did explore but briefly is tearing down the old faithful inn because it was too close but they someone wisely allowed them to keep that this is the inside of that building very geometric uh, once again you can see the laminated beams here open space a lot of this would be prefab and just imported. They could build it quickly, they could build it inexpensively, and they could accommodate the tourists that are arriving. And there's a Lake Lodge cabin. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, Fred just held on. He did what he could, but he did not like the modern architecture. He tried to build, he tried to design the modern architecture. It didn't work for him. He was in his 70s by this time. So in 1955, he designed his, I think one of the nicest pieces he did in his entire life, the Soldier's Chapel at Big Sky. And it still sits in this environment and the road up to Big Skies behind these trees. So when you experience Soldier's Chapel today, it was originally called Westport Chapel. You don't see the rest of Big Sky except for a few ski runs up here. <clears throat> and it was named for Nelson's story, the fourth. They call him Fourthy or Fourth. He was in the 163rd National Guard Regiment here in Bozeman, uh, based out of the old um, armory, which is now a hotel. And at the start of the war, the U.S. was so desperate for, for men to 
to be shipped off, certainly to, to Japan, to, to the Southwest Pacific, that they grabbed National Guard troops. And fourthly, he was a National Guardsman. And he ended up in New Guinea, ended up getting killed in 1944. And his father, who was Nelson Story III, took some of the family money and went to Fred and said, I want to have a, a chapel made for my son and the men of the 163rd Infantry. And that's what happened. This is, if you've never been in there, you have to stop there when you get to the big sky. You, there's a, a stoplight and you can go up to big sky or you go about 100 feet farther and there's a little sign, it says Soldier Chapel. And you turn in there and it, it is really a wonderful place. It has a picture window behind the altar that frames Lone Mountain. So if you've never been there, you have to go there. That's a must see. <coughs> so a year later, Fred died. He was 70, he was, he died in his, in his very own hospital there on Lamy. He built that in 1918. It's being torn down right now. He died in 1956 at the age of 78. And recapping really quickly, he did 175 jobs in Yellowstone Park. And these other things kind of add up, but he did 1,800 jobs total. And I, I'm not saying 1,800 homes from the ground up, 1,800 jobs. So he might replace a door. He might replace some damaged flooring. He might have done a paint scheme for, for a building. He might have gone back and redone something small in one of his buildings. But he had 1,800 total jobs. <clears throat> And, but the major, the major jobs are listed there. And that's all I have for tonight.